Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 14. We've been working through John for a while now, and we've been working through John 13 through 17 for the past month or so. And we come this morning to John 14, verses 15 through 26. Before I read that, let's pray together. Our Father, we delight that you have given us Christ Jesus, your Son. Uh, We have just rejoiced that he is all we have and he is all that we need. And we pray that you would help us to see that more fully this morning as we look at John 14. Open our eyes to see Jesus in all of his resurrection glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. John 14, uh, 15 through 26. These are the words of Jesus to his disciples near the end of his life, earthly life. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Let a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. How do you relate to Jesus? How do you relate to Jesus when he is not here, not physically anyway? How do you relate to Jesus when you can't see him, when you can't hear his voice or see his face or touch the scars on his hands? That was clearly a question in the early church Uh, Near the end of this book, John's Gospel, Thomas will refuse to believe in Jesus' resurrection until he touches the nail marks on Jesus' hands. And so Jesus shows up and says to Thomas, put your finger here. And Thomas falls at his feet and makes the good confession when he cries out, my Lord and my God. Jesus responds, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Peter uh, says in his first letter, though you have not seen Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. You see, from a, a secular perspective, the church had a PR problem. They said Jesus had risen from the dead, but if so, where was Jesus? And we invite people into a relationship with Christ, but where is Christ? Now we answer, rightly, that he is in heaven. But what does it look like to have a relationship with someone who is in heaven? Well, John actually has an answer for that. Well, Jesus has an answer for that in the Gospel of John, and he gets at it in our passage. 
And remember what's going on at this point in John's gospel. Jesus' ministry out in the world is over. His time has come. His crucifixion is near. And here he spends the last night of his earthly life getting his disciples ready, ready for his imminent death and ready for what comes next. Now, frequently, Jesus will say in these chapters that he is going away, and his leaving is understandably concerning, distressing to his disciples. What does it mean that Jesus is leaving? What does it mean for them? What does that mean for their future? If Jesus is gone, has it all been for nothing? Is it all over? And Jesus' answer consistently in these chapters is no. It is not over. Better things are yet to come. And in these chapters, Jesus is trying to help his first disciples understand those better things. I think a lot of us pine for the first century, and understandably so. Uh, We wish we could have seen Jesus, walked with him, talked with him, asked him questions, heard his answers, seen his kindness. But Jesus actually says there is something better. John 16, 7, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And so what will this post-resurrection relationship look like? We relate to Jesus today through acts of love from our side and by his word and spirit from his side. Jesus says if we love him, we will keep his commandments, and he will make himself known to us through his word and by his spirit. It's not flashy. We want dreams and visions and mountaintop experiences, but Jesus gives us the day in, day out, give and take of a reciprocal relationship with the God of heaven and earth. We love Jesus as we keep his commandments. He loves us by coming to us by his spirit and speaking to us in his word. Which brings us then to our outline this morning. Therefore, keep his commandments, delight in his presence, and stay in his word. First, keep his commandments. What do you love? What do you really love? Uh, What stirs your heart? What brings you joy? In what do you delight? Uh, The Bible has a whole book about passionate love. You may know this, the Song of Solomon. And it begins in verse 2, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. What to you is better than wine? Uh, What do you love? Uh, what, What you love is what is most important to you. What you love is what you daydream about when no one is around, uh, where you drift when you don't have anything else to do. Ultimately, you can only have one true love, and and I don't mean a romantic relationship, though that is also true, but I mean only one thing can have your whole heart. If you love two things, when they come into conflict, conflict, which one wins out, right? That's the one that you really love. That's the one that has your heart. And love is not peripheral to the biblical story. Paul says uh, the purpose of his teaching, 1 Timothy 1.5, the purpose of his teaching is love. Jesus teaches that the two greatest commandments are to love God and love our neighbor. And Jesus begins here in John 14.15, if you love me. And he says this again in verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. He says it again in verse 23, if anyone loves me, do you love Jesus? And you might wonder, well, why should I? Right? Maybe you you are here for the first time or, or maybe you have never really thought about the claims of Jesus and who he is and you're wondering, why should I love Jesus, a a, a Jewish Messiah that died on a cross 2,000 years ago. And the answer really is the same thing that you, same reason that you might love anything because he is lovely. We tend to love what is lovely. Jesus is lovely. Why is Jesus lovely? Because he loves us. Have you ever been loved by someone, really loved, so much so that you, you knew you were loved so loved that you felt it when you walked in the room. 
You just wanted to be around that person, right? We tend to be attracted to such people. Love is lovely. But how do we know that Jesus loved us? Because he died for us. And there is no greater love, Jesus said, than that someone should lay down their life for their friends. Or 1 John 3.16, by this we know love, John says, that Jesus laid down his life for us. Isaiah 53 puts it like this. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Jesus died in our place for our sins. He bore the Father's wrath that we deserved so that we might receive the Father's love that he deserves. Jesus loved us to death. And because of that, he is supremely lovely. Do you love him? How would you know? Uh, sometimes we look to our feelings, and feelings are good, uh, a God-given part of our humanity, but also fickle. Uh, our feelings change with the weather, right? They depend on whether we are hungry or tired or sick or well. Feelings come and go. Nothing stable and lasting was ever built upon feelings. And that's not where Jesus goes here either. What does Jesus say? He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, uh, obedience in our culture is kind of a dirty word. Uh, we, are, we are big on rebellion, on individualism, on authenticity, not so much on obedience. Every culture and every age has its errors. Other cultures might so focus on obedience that they slide over into conformity. Sometimes the church is like that. We assume that obedience to Jesus means everyone must look and act and be the same. Well, that's not true either. But if you can avoid the extremes of conformity and rebellion, Jesus says obedience is a mark of love. And he must mean it because he says it three times in our text. Uh, John 14, 15, if you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Now we tend to think of law and love as opposed to one another, or at least on different playing fields, right? Love is light and fun and happy, and law is kind of strict and dour and grumpy. But that is a character of both law and love. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And what does Jesus command? I, I don't want to oversimplify here, but try to summarize. In one sense, the whole Bible is what Jesus commands. But I do think it's not terribly complicated. I mean, let's just think about the Gospel of John, what we've read so far in John's Gospel. Uh, John 6, 28. The crowds ask Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answers them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. One of the things Jesus wants us to do is belief. But we can add to that. Uh, back in chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And he'll say it again in John 15, 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And so here are Jesus' commandments, that we believe in him and love as he loved. Believe in him and become like him. Now, I'm, I'm not saying there's not more to it than that. When Jesus says in verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Uh, that includes everything Jesus says. We believe and obey all of Jesus' teaching. But this is definitely the heart of it, isn't it? Believe in Jesus and love as Jesus loved. If we love him, we will believe in him and keep his commandments to love others as he loved us. And notice, though, here in John 14, 15, this actually is not a command. Uh, Jesus doesn't say here, if you love me, 
prove it, keep my commandments. Jesus isn't angling for us to obey. He simply says, this is the reality. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's what love does. Uh, There is no real relationship with Jesus apart from keeping his commandments. If you say you love Jesus but refuse to keep his word, you don't love Jesus. Because the fact of the matter is, you're not loving Jesus for who he is if you refuse to keep his word. He is Lord and King. To love a Lord and King as Lord and King is to obey them. Now, some feel that talk of obedience, it it feels icky. It uh, feels kind of legalistic, right? We just have to love Jesus. It's about relationship, not rules. But you know, as well as I do, that's not really the way it works. Uh, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And love delights to please the beloved. Do you love Jesus? Love delights to please the beloved. If you love Jesus, you will keep his commandments. Will you do it perfectly? Not in this life. We're all in process. That's not what this is about. You won't obey perfectly because you can't obey perfectly. We're not yet in glory. Don't get caught up focusing on the imperfection of your love. Focus on the one you love. If you love Jesus, you will want to keep his word. We love Jesus as we keep his commandments. He loves us by coming to us by his spirit and speaking to us in his word. Therefore, keep his commandments and delight in his presence. Jesus is describing a reciprocal relationship of discipleship. If we love Jesus, the motive, we will keep his commandments, the behavior, and he will make himself known to us through his word and spirit. Uh, Notice the, the flow of the passage, verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then verse 16 and 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Or uh, verse 21, notice the flow there. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Or again, verse 23, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now, there is a danger here of misunderstanding, of misunderstanding this text and of misunderstanding our relationship to Jesus in general. Uh, There are at least two ways we may get this relationship with Jesus wrong. There's a danger of seeing our relationship with Jesus as mechanical, and there's a danger of seeing our relationship with Jesus as static. Uh, Seeing it as mechanical would be treating the relationship as if it worked like a button or a switch or a crank, right? If I flip this switch, the light comes on, And legalism says, if I do X, then Jesus owes me Y. Or it might not be so blatantly legalistic. We might just think we can, we are in control. If I do X, Y will automatically follow in my relationship with Jesus. If I read the Bible, you know, then my day will go well or something like that. It's kind of superstitious. I call it mechanical because it assumes we can flip a switch and make things happen in our spiritual lives. But there's also a danger on the other side of seeing our relationship with Jesus as static. If the mechanical view sees change as automatic, the static view sees no change whatsoever. It goes like this. I'm forgiven, I'm justified, I'm counted righteous because of Jesus. And of course, if you are a believer, those things are all true. But then we conclude, therefore, nothing I do really matters in this relationship. It can't change or ebb or flow. Everything was settled by Jesus, and again, that's true judicially, But we draw the wrong conclusion that, therefore, there is never any change in the relationship. And, of course, no change means no growth. I can't grow closer to Jesus. He can't draw near to me. But, of course, that's not true. And here's why this is important to see at this point. Jesus is not giving us a formula. Uh, You love Jesus, you keep his commandments, and bam, right? You'll have the spirit, the Father will love you, and you will have a complete understanding of Jesus. No, he's telling us how relationships work. As we grow in love and grow in obedience, Jesus will meet us there. It is not that the gift of the Spirit is somehow dependent on our getting it all right. This text could be read in that way, but that's not what it is. I mean, notice the disciples throughout John's gospel, throughout all the gospels, constantly get it wrong. But in John 20, Jesus breathes on them and says, receive my spirit. He gives them the spirit after they fail him. Peter denies him, the rest run away, and then Jesus gives them the spirit. 
Or look at verse 23, right? If we read this mechanically, how does it sound? Verse 23, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. It sounds like the father's love is dependent on our love. We, we insert little words in there. Uh, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And then, therefore, those are words that we insert, my father will love him. But that could never be, right? John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loves first. And yet the end goal of the father's love is reciprocity, mutuality, the back and forth of love. Jesus' point is not something mechanical, right, if this, then that, but something relational, the mutuality of relational love. And Jesus' real point is this, right, if we are among Jesus' beloved disciples, his beloved ones, he is with us by his spirit. Jesus is painting the relationship for us, and he especially wants his disciples to know we are not alone. We are not orphans. We have the presence of the living God, Father, Son, and Spirit with us. And notice how many times Jesus says this. Verse 16, he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, the Spirit of truth. Verse 17, you know him, the Spirit, for he dwells in, with you in the person of Jesus and will be in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Verse 20, Jesus says he will be in his disciples. Verse 23, we, Father and Son, will come to the one who loves Jesus and make our home with him. Verse 26, the helper, the Holy Spirit, the Father will send in my name. See, if you are a disciple of Jesus, if you are among those who love Jesus and keep his commandments, Jesus is with you by his Spirit. And think first of the comfort Jesus intended this to bring. He was going away. He told his little band of 12 they could not follow. But he was not leaving them alone. In fact, he was not leaving them for good. He would send the Spirit. He would come to them in the person of the Spirit. He and the Father would make their home with them. And now think of the comfort that this means for us. If you are a disciple of Jesus, if you love him and keep his commandments, you have his Spirit within you. You, know, you may not feel any different. You may still be confused about certain points of theology. You may still struggle to overcome sin in your life, but you are not alone. Jesus is with you. He has come to you. Not first and foremost that you would have certain feelings or believe certain things or change your behavior. Not first, not primarily. He has come to you to make himself known. Jesus wants a relationship to manifest himself to you, which flows into all of those other things know that he is with you. Believe it by faith. Delight in that fact. We love Jesus as we keep his commandments. He loves us by coming to us by his spirit and speaking to us in his word. Therefore, keep his commandments, delight in his presence, and stay in his word. There's an interesting aspect to this passage that we haven't touched on yet, and it's one of the things that makes reading John 4, 14 through 16 actually tricky. Uh, Jesus is speaking to his hand-picked 12 disciples, those who walked with him and talked with him. Uh, we need to be mindful of this as we read the passage. In fact, I think there's a, a kind of a switch in the middle. In verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He is speaking there to and about the apostles. In verse 17, he says of the Spirit, he dwells with you, meaning the Spirit was with them in the person of Jesus. That, that was unique to them. We didn't have the Spirit-anointed Jesus walk with us through three years of our lives. In verse 19, Jesus says this, yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. When would they see him? Commentators throw out various options, but I think the most sensible is in his resurrection. And just consider the next phrase, because I live, you also will live. They will see Jesus alive once more. And then seeing Jesus alive has implications for them. And so verse 20, when it says then in that day, it means after the resurrection, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. 
Jesus is about to leave, first uh, by his death on the cross. They will be distraught, even despairing. Uh, They will think things are over. They don't yet get it. They don't understand. But then they will see Jesus after he rises from the dead. Again, we didn't see Jesus after he rose from the dead, but they did. And when they did, things began to click. In that day, you will know. But then in verse 21, Jesus begins to generalize. Uh, Verse 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But in verse 21, he says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Now, Jesus is taking what he just said to the 12, and he's applying it to all of us. Judas, not Iscariot, poor guy, is still focused on them. How will you manifest the world to us? uh, How will you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Judas asks. And Jesus answers again with something true for all people. Verse 23, he says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Uh, Verse 24 then gives kind of the opposite, the corresponding uh, flip side. He says, Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And then come these two, word, two verses, verses 25 and 26, which were important certainly for the 12 and then by implication for us. Notice what they say. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, Jesus is here clearly addressing the 12 in their historical particularity. He says, I have spoken to you while I am still with you. Uh, That is not true of us. It was only true of them. But the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Well, is that then for them or for us or for both or, or what? Well, keep reading. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. See, one of the Holy Spirit's roles was to remind the 12 of what Jesus had said. And notice how this played out. We actually have seen it throughout the Gospel of John so far. In John 2.22, when Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, everybody thinks he's talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem. But John tells us that he's talking about his body. And then John says this. He says, when therefore he was raised from the dead... His disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Or or John 12, 16, uh, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Uh, John 16, 4, uh, Jesus will say, but I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. Even when they get to the empty tomb, uh, John tells us in John 20, verse 9, for as, as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. You see, part of the Spirit's role was to remind the original apostles of everything Jesus had said to them. Only once Jesus was raised from the dead would they have all the puzzle pieces necessary to understand what Jesus had been saying this whole time. I mean, you've noticed, right? The disciples don't get it. But when Jesus rises from the dead and they receive the Spirit, then everything begins to click. And so once Jesus was raised and they received the Spirit, he reminded them, the Spirit reminded them and enabled them to put the pieces together and to understand Then and only then would the apostles begin to proclaim the apostolic message that Jesus was crucified for our sins and raised as Lord of heaven and earth. Now, what good is that for us? If that's the Spirit's role, as described here, to remind the original 12 apostles of what Jesus had said to them, what good is that for you and me? We didn't hear Jesus. How can the Spirit bring Jesus' words to our remembrance? How can we remember something we didn't hear in the first place? And the answer is through the scriptures. The Spirit reminded the apostles so that they could bear witness to what they saw and heard. That witness is recorded for us in the New Testament. That is what John's gospel is about. Uh, John 20, verses 30 to 31. Now, John says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written 
so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Or uh, 1 John 1, 1 through 3, uh, also written by the Apostle John. John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, not you and me, but the apostles, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. See, John saw and heard and touched and the Spirit reminded him of those things and then he proclaimed it to us. Peter says something similar in 2 Peter uh, 1. He says, therefore, I intended always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right, as long as I am in the body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. And Peter's words sound very similar to Jesus' words here in John 14, don't they? What the Holy Spirit did for the apostles in an immediate way, he has done for us through the written apostolic testimony. He reminded them what they heard, and he continues to remind us what the apostles saw and heard through the scriptures. The Holy Spirit continues to teach us all things and bring them to our remembrance through the apostolic testimony recorded in the Bible which is why our relationship with Jesus today means staying in his word, that we might remember all that he has said and continues to say to us through the spirit in the word. We love Jesus as we keep his commandments. He loves us by coming to us by his spirit and speaking to us in his word. Therefore, keep his commandments, delight in his presence, and stay in his word. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that we might love Jesus by keeping his commandments, delighting in his presence by the spirit, and staying in his word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.